Your voice, K Talk AM 1150. KTLK AM 1150, it is your voice. We are live on this July 4th. I'm David Cruz. Thank you for being here on this afternoon. I want to welcome back uh, a friend, uh, someone who is very informed on uh, things like uh, the political events of late here in Egypt in the last couple of days, and that is Professor Peter Matthews from Cyprus College. Uh, Professor, thank you for being with us on this July 4th. Happy Independence Day, Dave. Thank you, and uh, please remind everyone you're working on a great book, and I always like to talk about it because I want to be one of the first guys in line to get it. The name (laughs) of it is? Yes, Dollar Democracy with Liberty and Justice for Some. Reclaiming the American Dream for All. There you go. And, you know, part of my conversation that I wanted to have with you on this July 4th, in light of what's happened in Egypt, I've been reading the latest reports on gas prices. And, you know, it doesn't take much for speculators to step in. I now see that the price of oil, the barrel of oil, it has crossed uh, north of 100. They're at 102 bucks. Uh, I'm predicting this thing, depending on what happens in Egypt and Syria, you know, this thing can hover and go back up to about 110, 115, 125. Then we start seeing gasoline here get very pricey. What do you think is going to happen? Well, it's still in the air because there, the uh, Islamists have called, Muslim Brotherhood called for protest tomorrow, mm-hmm. to protest against the removal, temporary. Uh, by the government, by the military of the Islamic president, Morsi. And there's still conflict on the two sides, very major conflict. You're looking at millions of people on the streets for one side, that's the side that wants a secular Egypt, wants to have new elections. And the other side is the uh, Muslim Brotherhood had have th- thousands on the streets. So you got this major conflict still. It's not resolved, Dave, and the price of oil is going up. It's already $102 a barrel, and, and $5 you- increase. Absolutely. And the irony seems to be to me, Professor, that America today, is able to process more crude here than it imports. In other words, we we are becoming somewhat less dependent on the Suez Canal, less dependent on on the Middle East for 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 fuel for crude oil, and yet we continue to see these kinds of cause and effect situations. How much of this yeah. is uh, speculation? Let me that, if you don't mind, I'll explain that. Sure. To Oil is bought and sold in the world market. Mm -hmm. So if we produce more oil here, it doesn't mean we're using it here. We're actually exporting more oil than we're of our own oil to go around to the world market than we are using it here. Because we also buy Venezuelan oil. We buy oil from Saudi Arabia. It's all mixed up in the world market, Dave. That's why any kind of a disruption like this affects the entire world market. So you have to look at the entire supply and demand picture globally. Globally, exactly. Uh Uh-huh. All right, but then how is it that we feel it so quickly? In other words, how is it, and I know part of it this week was the excise tax because California says, okay, Californians are conserving on, on, on the use of fuel. Let's go ahead and increase the excise tax. We're now paying the highest, 72 cents per gallon. Uh, I'd like to get your take on that because from an economic standpoint, since you are a student of political science and well, actually a professor, what do you tell your students about the impact this has on the economy of a state like California? Well, any time that energy prices go up, it has a major impact, especially oil prices because our gas prices as well. It's like the foundation of or the infrastructure, you know, a lot of things are made with oil. Plastics, for example, we drive our cars on it. So it's going to hurt the economy. What I tell them, though, is that excise tax increase is not the major problem right now. The major problem is that we're not exploring enough and developing and investing enough in alternative energy, Dave. We've got so much potential. We've got uh, windmills we could put out off the ocean coast. We could put tide power, tides in the water. You know, the, uh, so why aren't we, the, Professor? Why Solar in- power. Uh, it has to do, I think, with special interests in the legislature and in Congress. You know, the, the oil industry is one of the most highly powered special interests with lots of money to lobby between elections and to donate to campaigns of members of Congress who are not going to invest the money like they should. We've got to clean Congress out, basically, of dollar democracy and get people in there who are looking ahead. We're saying we can create more jobs by having alternative energy sources developed fully. And you have to have a feed-in tariff. You could right away get more people to put solar panels on their roofs if we would pay a much higher price when they sell the energy back to the utilities after using what uh, they need. Germany has that, Dave, and they've got 40% of their energy right now from solar panels, from alternative energy in Germany. It's the leading country in the world. They're so you're saying that we all could become more productive and more engaged with solar if the incentive was greater than it is right now. There's just not enough of an incentive. That's all it is, basically, and you could pay off. If you had that kind of feed-in tariff, we could pay off our solar 
panels in less than three years. Oh. <laughs> that's what that's, that's the difference. We As opposed to 25, which when that's people right. think about that, they'll say, well, I'm not going to be here that long. And, right. and, I, and I'm glad you mentioned Germany because one of the things that I always tell people when we discuss uh, things like this, the forward thinking, years before it, it, it began to even take hold here in America, kids were already getting rid of their of their of their backpacks full of books, and they were using tablets. Uh, they've had solar. They've had wind. They've moved forward way faster than we have. They've been using alternative forms of transportation. Why are we so stubborn here in America, even in states like California that are more progressive, to make this kind of a change? I think it goes back to the, the way the political system operates. In Germany, they have a system where the political parties... They get free and equal airtime on television uh, when they run for office. They don't have to buy a bunch of commercials. So the candidates don't have to raise big money from big oil. Over here, it's the other way around. Our candidates go out and beg for money from big oil, big energy, pharmaceuticals. And when they get in there, they've got to really pass the, the brakes for those guys. And supposed to cut thinking ahead, how do we create a mass transit system that would be efficient, affordable, and would be so rapid that people will be, would love to ride it? We could do that. We could go from here to Vegas in a maglev train that they have in oh. Germany for years now. 350 miles an hour, Dave. They have Amazing. Germany, Japan, France. All those countries have it. So we could do it here with the biggest. We got the best scientists in the world here. We could put them to work. Absolutely. Our government leaders were not so distracted and Before, corrupted. Before I, I let you go, I, I, I must ask you, uh, AB 955 and the double whammy that some of the kids are getting in community colleges, Professor, where where there was an attempt to, uh, again, come up with premium classes and we have seen other attacks on community colleges. Uh, your latest take on what you've seen, I know that right now the report we get is that the Senate Appropriations Committee in Sacramento is not going to move AB 955 forward, at least not for now, but we've got to find a long-term solution for funding community colleges. Your thoughts? Absolutely. In fact, AB 955 has just suspended. It's not been pigeonholed or killed. Oh, like that the, good word, good they word. Could Thank you. They back in any time if they wanted to, and they may do that. They, they may have taken the, felt the heat for a little while and said, let's hold off for a little, but we got to make sure that the AB 955 never, and the principle is based on should never be implemented, bring back the master plan for higher education fully like it used to be, and bring the money in, in my view, through closing some of the most egregious corporate tax loopholes at the state level, and the federal level. There's about $11 billion a year being lost in California to unnecessary, unfair corporate loopholes, uh, giving these uh, stock option loopholes to big companies like Facebook and Apple and others who don't pay billions in taxes per year. Unconscionable. You know? unconscionable. It's, not, it's unconscionable. It really is. And so we have to have people in office who care about the public interest, not their own private interests or those of their sponsors. By the way, Professor, I just got uh, an update from my friend and colleague, uh, Ruben Guerra, the chair of the LBA, the Latin Business Association, who is one of the advocates for uh, alternative energy and leads in, uh, in some of the LED innovations, uh, trying to help municipalities make a conversion. Uh, saying that the ROI, the return on investment in solar right now, he, he believes it's about seven years. So we're still lagging. We're still yeah. lagging behind the efficiencies of Europe, and I think we can do a better job, Professor. Absolutely. We will do that, too. we got to get the right people into office, Dave. It's always good to have you on the program. We, uh, You kind of make it classier. Thank you again, <laughs> Professor, <laughs> on this July so 4th. All right. I uh, appreciate it. All right. There you go. Uh, Professor Peter Matthews, a political science analyst, very well known. We're going to put a link on our website.